Hello, welcome to the channel and welcome to my tournament and army review for my white scars. Uh, so this past weekend I attended the Surrey Warhammer 40k tournament. This was a 1750 points three game Eternal War tournament to which I decided to take uh, my White Scars army to test them out. I've been playing my White Scars since about 5th edition, I believe, 5th or 6th edition. And this was the first time that I was taking them to a tournament with the new supplement. I hadn't played many games, so I put together a list that I thought would work well and see how it would get on and how I could modify it. So, first of all, I'm going to take you through my army. Then I'm going to give you a quick overview of the games I played and then talk about some of the tactics I used and some changes I made to the list. So first off, my army is a double battalion, giving me 13 command points to start with. In the HQ, I have a can on bike, who comes with the can spear. I've given him two warlord traits using one of the stratagems in the book, so I've given him uh, Chagorian Storm, which gives him plus d3 attacks on the charge or heroic intervention. And I've also given him Master of Snares, which when an enemy unit within an inch attempts to fall back from combat on a 4+, plus, they cannot. I've also given him the Relic Bike, the Master of the Heavens. So this is a bike that allows him to move 16 inches in the movement phase and allows him to ignore terrain and units. So it's essentially like he has the fly keyword, a jet bike. However, it only works in the movement phase, so you have to be careful when you're assaulting uh, through ruins or to units up in ruins, etc. In the second unit in the HQ for the battalion, I've taken a librarian with a jump pack and a force stave, and he has Ride the Winds, which is a casting value of 6, and allows you to add 2 inches to the charge in advance of a selected unit within 12 inches. He also has Storm Wreathed, which is select a unit within 12 inches, casting value of 6, and they cannot be fired upon by Overwatch by enemy fire. And also, when they end a move within 1 inch of an enemy unit, on a 6, the unit suffers a mortal wound. He also took the Mantle of the Storm Seer, giving him plus 1 to casting these powers, but not to smite. In the 2nd Battalion, I have another Captain on a bike. And he has the Teeth of Terror, so this gives him 8 attacks on the charge with uh, strength 6, sorry, strength 5, apologies, strength 5, AP minus 2, and 2 damage. I've also taken a Lieutenant with a Jump Pack, a Power Axe, and a Mastercrafted Bolter. For my troops units, I have 3 units of Scouts, 2 with Bolters, and the Sergeants have Chainswords and one with uh, bolt pistols and combat knives. I also have three units of five tactical marines, one with a power sword and a flamer, one with a heavy bolter, and one with a plasma cannon. I have got uh, two fast attack units. I have a unit of five scout bikers. These come with twin bolters, shotguns, and combat knives. And I have a unit of five bikers with two melter guns and a power axe on the sergeant. For my elites, I have one unit of vanguard veterans, five with two chainswords and five with a chainsword and a plasma pistol to give me some good combat ability and some decent firepower with the plasma pistols. For my heavy support, I have a thunderfire cannon and I've got a unit of five devastators with four grav cannons and a combi grav on the sergeant. Another elite unit, I also have a unit of five stern guard veterans with their special issue bolters. And for dedicated transports, I have two rhinos with a storm bolter and a drop pod with a storm bolter. So this came in at 1750 points. As I say, I've spent uh, one command point before to give my warlord an extra uh, Warlord trait, and I've spent an extra 2 CP on 2 extra relics 
for the librarian and for the second captain. So my thought for this army was that it contains a lot of fast moving elements, a lot of powerful elements for the white scars. I wanted to give the Grav Devastators in the drop pod another chance because they uh, have that good stratagem, Gravitic Amplification, allowing them to reroll to wound and reroll the damage. Three scout units for board control, some tactical marines for holding objectives, the Thunderfire Cannon for hitting units out of line of sight and blocking uh, long range firepower or for doing some long range firepower. Uh, a couple of bike units for fast elements, the Vanguard Veterans to deep, either deep strike in and do some damage in combat. Uh, with the dual chain swords, two attack base and the shock assault rule, each of these will be getting either five attacks for the dual chain swords or four attacks for the plasma pistols. So, that's so just to take you through some of my thoughts in the army before I played the games and what I was thinking about tactically when I chose this force. So the cannon bike is my warlord and due to his relics he has uh, he's able to move 16 inches normally and add his advance to that get, that gives him a 22 inch move that ignores units and terrain so this gives him and he can also assault after advancing so he can advance 22 inches and he can still assault so this gives him a great threat range for taking on enemy units in most deployment zones unless your opponent is deploying pretty deep which did happen sometimes in this tournament he's probably going to get a first turn charge off so coupled with the librarian you can cast ride the winds and storm wreathed on the captain and this gives him plus two inches to his charge range and also doesn't allow enemy units to fire overwatch at them. So what you can do is advance the librarian, advance the can, uh, move him up to 22 inches, then charge with them, getting plus two to your charge, and the enemy can't fire overwatch at them. He also has the trick with his warlord trait where he can prevent units from falling back on a four plus. So the plan with the can was to move them up, charge, depending on your enemy's deployment, charge multiple enemy units who can't fire overwatch at them and keeps them safe, put all his attacks into one or a couple of units and then leave something alive so that they cannot fall back in the, their following movement phase and this keeps them safe from the enemy firepower. If you're able to wrap up at least two or even three, depending on your opponent's deployment, enemy units, then you've got good odds, along with the command point reroll, you've got good odds of keeping at least one locked in combat. So that's what he did in a lot of my games. He was also joined by the scout bikers who are able to move that far as well. So he could charge in with them, keep the scout bikers safe from firepower if the units couldn't fight back and a couple of the stratagems that I used regularly on the scout bikers were born in the saddle allowing them to advance and still shoot their weapons so they come with twin bolters and shotguns which could generally get into the half range to make them strength five so this gave this unit a lot of firepower as well as re-rolling ones thanks to having the uh, cannon bike nearby Another one that I used quite frequently in the bikers was from the Space Marine Codex and it was Skilled Rider, giving them a 3 up in vulnerable save against enemy shooting attacks uh, when they advance, which they did in most cases. So in a lot of my games this allowed me to get a first turn charge with a couple of my units against enemy units in the key enemy units in the, the, my opponent's army. The scouts were there for board control, pushing back any enemy deep strikers, drop pods, things like that. Um, they're also pretty good because they can advance and charge. If you deploy them nine inches away from the enemy deployment zone, they can also generally get a first turn charge off if you roll a decent advance roll and get high into the enemy uh, deployment zone. And they're also good for grabbing objectives. The tactical squads, 
The one with the heavy bolt or the one with the plasma cannon were generally used as backfield uh, objective holders. So they didn't have to, they could stay in cover, stay out of line of sight or stay in terrain to get a couple of shots off and hold my objectives along with the Thunderfire Cannon which has a couple of nice stratagems allowing him to shoot twice and also using Tremor Shells. The Drop Pod Devastators were going to be an Alpha Strike unit coming in and selecting a tough enemy unit or an enemy unit I wanted to take out and do some firepower there. The Vanguard Veterans I would hold in reserve Bring them on later to either go after objectives or mop up some enemy units on turn 2 or 3, depending on when they were needed. The Stern Guard veterans went in one of the rhinos to push up the table, using the White Scar Stratagem Rapid Disembarkation, I think it's called. They can disembark and move after the rhinos moved up, so this allows them to get in the firepower range. In the other Rhino, I generally had the five-man tactical squad with the Flamer and the Power Sword, getting them up the table. A unit of bikers with two melter guns to give me some anti-tank, and uh, a Power Axe on the Sergeant, which along with Shock Assault, gives me some good, uh, fight, good combat ability. So that was my general thoughts on the army, uh, and how they would perform. I'm going to take it over, quickly take you through my games. I will be writing these up as full battle reports on my blog, St Andrews Wargaming. So if you're a fan of written battle reports with the maps that I use in my video ones and descriptions and tactical uh, discussions, check it out on the blog, St Andrews Wargaming. You can also, I have a Facebook page, also St Andrews Wargaming, where you can keep up to date with uh, any hobby stuff that's ongoing or when any new battle reports or video battle reports come up. So the first game of the day was Vital Intelligence using Dawn of War deployment. So Vital Intelligence is the mission with one central objective and four objectives on the sort of diagonals in the centre of the diagonals going to each corner. How this mission works is you roll uh, a d6 at the start of the battle round and whatever number you roll, that objective is worth two points, every other objective is worth one point if you hold it. Unless you roll a six, in which case all objectives are worth two points. You score your points at the end of the battle round, so this gives the player who's going second quite a useful um, tactical advantage as you can wait to see what your opponent moves to do and then seize on their wherever the deployment is or any mistakes and grab the objectives. This presents a tactical challenge because sometimes uh, with the White Scars you want to be going first, especially if you're deploying your scouts aggressively or you want to get your first turn charge off to deal with enemy units. So it can be a toss up between whether you take the first turn to do maximum damage or go second to try and grab the objectives. So it depends on your opponent and the table deployment, uh, the terrain. So my first opponent for game one was Craig with uh, an Alatok Eldari army and some Harlequins allied in as well. He had a Warlock on a jet bike and a Farseer on the jet bike. Uh, the Farseer had Doom and Fortune and the Farseer had Quicken and Restrain. He had a unit of 5 Dire Avengers and a unit of, I believe, 19 Guardians with a heavy weapons platform. He also had a unit of 5 Rangers. He had a unit of, I think, 8 uh, Jet Bikes, Shine Spear Jet Bikes, which can be pretty tough when they're buffed up. He had 2 Night Spinners and he had a Hemlock Wraith Fighter, so some pretty good um, firepower that were damaged too, so a lot of trouble for my bikes with high AP. For the Harlequin segment, he had two Death Jesters, a Saltair and a Spirit Seer, and he had a unit of, I think it was six, of the Skyrunner jet bikes, who again are pretty good with their Haywire and with the ability to fall back and still shoot and charge, so it was difficult to tie them up. 
So, I think this was a... I saw his list before the game started, and I thought this was going to be a tough matchup for the mission. Um, as I say, he had a lot of damage to firepower, which could cause problems from a bite. He had a very fast-moving army, so, you know, I couldn't use my speed to much of an advantage. And those Shining Spears can be pretty tough once he gets the psychic buffs up on them. They can do a lot of damage in shooting combat. So, I won the role for Deployment Zone, unfortunately, which meant that Craig got to set up his army first, which he did so. Um, we both sort of deployed with our refused flank, so I placed the majority of my units on my right hand flank. I put the all the bikers, all the characters, my two rhinos on the right hand side and the tactical squad with the Thunderfire Cannon in the ruins holding an objective on the right. On the left I put a unit of the tactical squad, I think with the plasma cannon, and a unit of scouts on a set of runes on the left, holding another objective. I should mention we were playing the ITC rune rules, so the ground floors were blocking. I put the combat scouts in the centre, hidden behind some runes, uh, ready to move up on the central objective. And I put a unit of scouts on the right flank, as he'd put a night spinner on each flank, and I wanted to be able to charge that out of line of sight to avoid the overwatch and tie it up from shooting. So in reply, oh, sorry, Craig deployed first and he put a night spinner in the runes on each flank and he put the bulk of his army on his uh, right flank as well. So ev basically everything but a single night spinner went on his right, meaning our armies were diagonally opposite one another. So it would take at least a couple of turns to get round. Uh, to do some damage there. He put some, I think he put some Dire Avengers in the front and he put his uh, big Guardian Bomb in reserve. Craig then chose to give me first turn, uh, which I was expecting in this scenario. As I say, you kind of want to go second to grab the objectives. My plan was to hit the Shining Spears hard and try and do as much damage to them as possible before you could get the buffs up on them and do some damage. Uh, I started, I advanced most of my army on the right flank using the 3 up invun stratagem on the scout bikers. I didn't use the uh, bond the saddle stratagem simply because they had no good targets to shoot at. So what I was able to do in my first turn was I advanced the cannon bike and I moved my scouts up and able, was able to get a first turn charge on the night spinners, one of the night spinners. Fortunately I wasn't able to destroy it in the combat phase and I was able to keep it tied up in his first turn keeping that unit safe. And in my turn I was able to finish it off and destroy it allowing on my second turn to move and assault with my uh, Warlord, which was what I was thinking about tactically before the game started. So he was able to keep the unit, he wasn't able to destroy it, but he was able to keep it locked up in combat to stop it from falling back, so I was safe from enemy firepower. Um, did make a few tactical errors in this game, one of the big ones was I brought my Devastators in turn one and sent them after the Shining Spears. The way he deployed them meant they were outside 12 inches, so I was minus one to hit because of a lay talk. I was also minus one to hit because I was moving and shooting heavy weapons, and then kind of expected he played lightning reflexes on them, meaning my Devastators were hitting on sixes. Uh, this severely hurt their firepower and was kind of a theme throughout the tournament. I did manage to kill two of the jet bikes, which was quite nice, um, but I don't think that was worth it for their firepower and certainly not for the use of the CP. I put, um, as the expression goes, good money after bad by firing the thunder cannon in at them as well, and I think I only 
I fired it twice, spent the 2cp to fire it twice, but I think I only did like a single wound with two volleys after, even though I was hitting on fours, um, just some horrendous rolling meant that I, I didn't do any real damage. So my first turn alpha strike had taken out two of the jet bikes, uh, the shining spears, but it still left plenty left to cause some damage, unfortunately. So that was a bit of an error on my point. What I think I should have done was put the Thunderfire after the unit died Avengers to wipe them out for first strike, because I didn't get first strike because I wasn't able to destroy the Night Spinner. Um, the Devastators I either should have held off for later so that they could get to a good target and get within 9 inches for the uh, to use the abilities there. What or what I think I should have done in hindsight was send the Devastators after either his Flyer or the other Night Spinner. Probably the Flyer. He would have played Lightning Reflexes on it, so I was hitting on fives. However, with the Gravitic Amplification, I would have been re-rolling to Wound. I would have been hitting on fives, but re-rolling to Wound and he wouldn't have had such an invun save. The, so the Shining Spears have the 4-up invun save, uh, whereas the Flyer wouldn't have had such a good save. I don't recall if they have an invun, I don't believe, but with the Devastator Doctrine, my uh, grab cans would have been ignoring a save, so any hits, reroll to wounds, reroll damage. I might have been able to severely hurt the Flyer or even kill it, which would have been great because that was a big uh, problem for me during the game. As I say, it's got the auto-hitting guns that do 2 damage and are strength 10 or tw or even higher. So they're wounding my bikes on 2s, auto-hitting them and ignoring their save much of the time unless I give them an invun. So that would have been a better bet to go after with my Devastator. So that was, that was a couple of mistakes I made in that turn. Uh, Predictably in his first turn, the Shining Spears came up to the centre where I put the Devastators and the Scouts on the objective and killed the combination of shooting and uh, combat, managed to kill the Devastators and the Scouts quite easily and they were able to consolidate into the drop pod after a horrendous round of rolling from the jet bikes failed to destroy it which probably worked out well because it kept them safe from my firepower and he did. Uh, I think the flyer shot at the scout bikers, but thanks to my 3-up invun, I think I only lost one or two. I didn't lose many, so that was quite nice. Um, my second turn, I sort of pressed on. As I say, in his turn, I was able to destroy the night spinner. So my captain on the jet, the jet bike on his relic was able to advance into the central ruins along with one of my tactical squads from the Rhino and charge and finish off the Shining Spears. Uh, the other Harlequin jet bikes proved problematic so in the course of the game they moved up on his right flank and took out my units holding the objective there to claim that. Um, the game should have been Craig's. Uh, he was doing a lot of damage to me doing some very serious firepower. So I was bringing my units over from the right flank to deal with his units on the left flank, whereas his flyer was going around and causing real problems for me. Um, the, I think it was turn three, we rolled multi-ball. So all the objectives were worth, worth two points. I was sitting on three, he was sitting on one, and the central one, I had a... Uh, I still had a tactical squad, he managed to take out my warlords with his attacks and shooting, he managed to take him out. He then had a unit of five tactical marines to deal with, so his farseer and his warlock went in, did some shooting and killed all but one tactical marine. His farseer and his warlock then charged the remaining tactical marine and completely failed to kill him. I think he... He got a lot of his attacks through, but with no AP, I got lucky on my armor saves, and he survived. So that gave me a 8-point swing, because I held 4 objectives that were worth 2 points, and he had 1. 
So that gave me an 8 point swing. I should also mention we were playing kill points as well. Uh, which helped him because he was racking up a lot of kill points and doing a lot of damage. So, as it was, tactically things went okay. I made a couple of mistakes, as I say, on the first turn. The other mistake I made was not activating the Assault Doctrine on turn 3. Uh, so, he'd moved his units round, he'd blitzed his Saltair to take out my Librarian. I'd then moved my Bikers up, the Scout Bikers were dead at this point. The Bikers moved up, put their Bolt of Fire into the Saltair to wipe him out. I then charged his Farseer, I think I'd killed the Warlock with a Flamer, or with... Uh, actually, I think my Drop Pod managed to shoot and kill his Warlock after some poor saving throws from him. Uh, Charged my charged his farseer with the captain and the lieutenant and managed to take him down to a single wound. Had I the assault doctrine activated, he would have died because I would have been doing plus one damage on all my wounds. So that was annoying and I think that helped cost me the game. The other mistake I made was I brought in my Vanguard veterans and managed to get a charge on one of the units. So the pistol unit managed to charge a unit of rangers that were screening the uh, other night spinner. And they managed to charge them, wipe out all but one of the rangers and wrap them to stop him from falling back. They then killed him in Craig's turn and consolidated into the night spinner to keep them safe from, uh, to allow me to attack. I then, mistakenly, I think that was a mistake, consolidating them, um, because then I would have been able to move an assault, so that was another error. I shot my pistols at the night spinner, I actually managed to blow up, to kill it, uh, in my turn with my pistols in the combat phase, but this meant, my plan was to pile in onto the objective, because I wasn't quite on it, so I was able to pile into the objective and grab that. However, this was on the fourth turn, which turned out to be the final turn. I killed it with the pistols by overcharging, which I shouldn't have done. Um, so that meant I couldn't consolidate in to grab the objective, and he was able to grab it. So in the end, it was a really fun game, really close game, but I did loot. I lost it 26 points to 25. So... Uh, Craig played it very well, he didn't make too many, I can't think of any major tactical flaws that he made, so what lost me the game I think, I, I thought the game was going to go a lot worse, I didn't think it was going to be that close, so there was a few decisions I made um, tactically that were wrong, turn 1 my target priority was way off, um, and turn... I put a lot of firepower in the Shining Spears, which was a complete mistake, because I was hitting them on sixes, they had their four up in one, I should have just waited for them to go after the central objective and charge them with my characters to take them out, which is what happened, because they don't get the in one in combat, and with my either Teeth of Terror attacks or my uh, Can on Bikes attacks, he just he rinsed the whole unit basically on his own. So. Putting all that firepower into them was a mistake. I should have gone after the flyer and tried to at least severely hurt that or kill it um, and do some damage to that. One thing I did do was in one of my turns I used the storm wreath power on the uh, lieutenant to stop the overwatch fire on him and then charged him into the flyer hoping to do some damage. I think I took a couple of wounds off it. Because I was able to fire my scout bikers and bikers at it and do some damage, but not enough to kill it. So, I think send if I'd have been able to take that out with the grab devastators, which maybe I'd need to sit and go through the math and see if that was possible, that would have done a lot of damage. The thunder fire cannon could have wiped out the dire avengers easily to give me first blood. And I could have done uh, some more damage. So a couple of other tactical things, the Rhinos were pretty useful, the ability to advance and still charge was great for tying up enemy units. They were also working quite nicely as screening, 
Um, so a lot of the times I moved my tactical squads or my scouts into a set of ruins which had objectives on them and then I was able to use the rhinos to essentially box them in and keep them out of line of sight of enemy firepower. So if Craig wanted to grab those objectives, he had to charge in, which is what he had to do with uh, his guardians and a couple other units. So that was a... they were very useful in that, and I think maybe one of them was destroyed in the game, but the other wasn't. Um, the Thunderfire Cannon did okay, did some work to the guardians, helped take out some Dire Avengers, but the, the minus one to hit penalty... Um, Hurt him a little, although going up to Ballistic Skill 2 was great. So overall, some tactical things to learn, but unfortunately I didn't learn them all for this tournament. And uh, some interesting results. So a narrow loss for my first game, but I was feeling good because I expected that game to go a lot worse. Had I gone second, um, it might have gone better actually. His... The problem with going second, I think, was his flyer. I got my invun off on the scout bikers, which saved them from the flyer. Did a, did a lot of work for them. Um, had I gone second, I think the flyer probably would have gutted one of my biker units, which would have been annoying. And his night spinners, which honestly performed horribly the whole game, I think the highest number of shots he rolled was like 6 on 2d6 through the whole game and with no AP they really struggled to take out my units in cover or my bikers. So that was problematic. So uh, the Shining Spears might have moved on to the objective or he might have held them back for a second turn. But what it would have allowed me to do would be to put the Devastators into them without the minus 1 from the lay talk. And also, he didn't have uh, the power that gave them plus one save, protect, which is normally what causes the problems with the Shining Spears, because they got a two up armor save and a three up invun against shooting. So I was worried about that, but he didn't have that power. So I think that was um, going second. I'm not sure how the game would have went. I, I may have chosen to go first if I had the option, um, but... Going second may have allowed me to hit a few more of his units hard. He probably wouldn't have got the haywire shots in at my rhinos. I don't think they would have been in range. The flyer might have taken out a bike unit, but that was probably would have been okay for where it went. It would have allowed both my characters to probably charge in and clean out the Shining Spears on turn one had they moved up towards the objective. Had they not done that, then my scouts probably would have been able to grab it, or I would have been able to turbo boost a unit of bikers onto it to grab it. So I'm not sure how that would have gone on my first turn. Um, but we don't know. So that was my first game. Hope that was made sense. It was a useful summary. I'll go on to my game two. The mission for game three was four pillars. This is where you have four objectives on the centre of each of the diagonals, reaching from the centre of the board. The objectives can only be scored by troops, and each objective is scored. Um, if you control more objectives than your opponent, you score one point. If you control all four objectives, you gain three points for that turn. And we were also using kill points. Now, the objectives could only be held by troops. So with six units of troops in my army, uh, who were either infiltrating or in rhinos, I thought this was okay. My opponent for game two was Mark with his uh, Yunari Harlequins and uh, Drukari Force. The Drukari Force consisted of two Archons, three units of Cable Light Warriors and five Venoms. Uh, the Yunari Force was the Yinkarn. The, the big monster one. Uh, three units of troops, a troop master, a star weaver, and the um, haywire jet bikes, the sky weavers. He did a unit of six of them, I believe. Uh, I thought, again, this was going to be a tough matchup because he had a lot of 
fast moving vehicles that were minus one to hit they with invulnerables and I didn't have a huge amount of high strength firepower to take them out. So uh, you could move quickly up the board and get to me. For deployment I went for a refused flank again. I put most of my units on the left hand side of the board where his battlefield was a bit more open. He had runes in the centre and on the left. Uh, the problem again with hammer and anvil being uh, quite far to go. I put the Thunderfire, a unit of scouts, a unit of tactical marines uh, on the objective towards the right and a unit of tactical marines on the objective to my left. In reply, he deployed most of his Venoms and his units quite far away uh, towards the back of the board. Again, they can move quickly, they've got some good durability, a lot of splinter firepower. So he wasn't wanting to get charged on turn one. I had a couple of scout units ahead. I did make one mistake here in that I thought, when I spoke to my opponent before the game, I thought, I asked him and I thought that um, the objectives were scored each turn, not at the end of the battle round. So I took the first turn with my plan being to rush forward, grab all four objectives and go three points up. I had a unit of scouts that could get an objective and by advancing my transports and using the stratagem to disembark and advance the tactical marines I was confident I could get to the other objective. <clears throat> Unfortunately that wasn't the case, it was the end of the battle round so again that was on me for not reading the mission properly but also um, my opponent agreed with me that it was the end of the turn so that was unfortunate. So I took the first turn which in hindsight was probably a mistake Rushed everything forward, um, all the bikes and rhinos advanced, put an invun save on the scout bikers and kept my back units. Again, foolishly brought the drop pod in on turn one. The Devastators fired on the uh, a unit of Harlequins that were in the open, uh, not in the open, they were in ruins but I figured I didn't want to fire at his vehicles because I was, they were already, the Venoms were minus one to hit. I was minus one to hit on uh, moving with my heavy weapons and I was sure he was going to play lightning fast reflexes to give me another minus one. So at least with the troop I was hitting on fives instead of sixes. However, um, that didn't do much good as I think I only killed a couple of the unit. Again. Fired twice with the Thunderfire Cannon, another troop, um, so spent 2 CP and only managed to kill one after some horrendous rolling from me and some great saves from my opponent. So wasn't feeling that confident about turn one. I didn't get first strike. I did charge the Archon and surround him with my scouts. Couldn't hurt the Archon but he didn't kill any scouts which was a good bonus but they just got wiped up the next turn. His first turn, the Star Weavers, uh, sorry, Sky Weavers, the jet bikes, used Fire and Fade to jump out and fire at my Rhino. Here's where I got lucky, and uh, he failed to kill the Rhino with the unit of six. He just rolled quite poorly for the number of mortal wounds. A lot of hits, but rolled poorly for the mortal wounds. Put a lot of splinter fire into my Scout Bikers. And again, the three up in one helped me out. I think I only lost one if I lost any. So a great round of saves from me. Um, sort of kept me in the game. He did get first strike by killing the scouts that were in combat. I think the Yinkarn charged in and killed them. <clears throat> Turn two, I moved up and advanced everything again. Managed to get the psychic power storm wreathed off on my captain. And in the fight phase, uh, I was able to charge in to three Venoms and the Skyweavers, lock all four up in combat and not fire Overwatch, piled in with the Scout Bikers as well. The Captain attacked the Skyweavers, hoping to take that unit out or do some damage. Again, my opponent played uh, Lightning Fast Reflexes on him and I think I got four wounds through. Um, after some poor hit rolls and wound rolls and he made two of the saves 
another save with a CP reroll, so I killed one of them and he took the one that was in base contact with my captain, as expected. Um, I was hoping to really put a big dent in the unit rather than just kill one. Then he had, to make up for the shooting phase, he had an incredible round of combat with the Sky Weavers and wiped out all the uh, Scout Bikers. I think killed the entire unit, managed to do like seven wounds on them, wounding on fives I think, because they didn't charge, and wiped them out. Fortunately in the next turn, uh, my captain was able to keep two of the Venoms in combat with him to stop them from falling back and stop him from being shot. The Star Weavers jumped over, killed one of the, sorry, Sky Weavers jumped over, killed one of the Rhinos. In his first turn he sent a unit of Harlequins and the Star Weaver up to go after my objectives and they sort of travelled up the board, did some damage. Um, <clears throat> turn two, things were still tricky. Again, the game I think should have been my opponents but I had an incredible round of armour saves. I think two of his Venoms shot at my unit of bikers who didn't have an invun uh, with their splinter rifles. Both Venoms and the crew inside did, I think, nine wounds each, and I didn't feel a single arm save, which was incredibly unlikely. Um, so that helped keep me in the game because he wasted a lot of firepower. He killed, he managed to kill off my uh, Devastators quite easily. I think he, he killed off the Rhino, he did a few wounds on other units, couldn't hurt my captain. Charged the Zarkon in but was unable to do anything and I think I put a few wounds on one of the Venoms since I was down back down to strength 4. So, turn 2, a game I thought was going to be over pretty quickly, was still in it, fortunately. My third turn brought in the two units of Vanguard Veterans, overcharged at the Plasma Pistols at one of the Venoms. Um, managed to do four wounds, killing one of my own guys in the process because the captain wasn't close enough. And then he made like three five up in runs and then I feel no pain on one of them. So I did one wound on the Venom and one wound on my guy. The key in my third turn was remembering to activate the tactical doctrine. So I fell back with my can on bike and was able to charge in my can, my lieutenant and the other captain uh, I basically charged most of my army that wasn't in my backfield. The only charge I think I failed was the dual chainsword Vanguard veterans who had combat squatted. They failed, the plasma pistol ones made it in and the extra AP and the two damage allowed me to absolutely shred most of his units. The venoms fell, the, star, uh, the sky weavers fell most of the units in his deployment zone went. So I think I was losing by I think three or four points at that stage and I managed to get 10 kill points in a single turn through the shooting and through the uh, firepower, through the combat. And that was mostly thanks to the Assault Doctrine and the special bonus that the White Scars get. So that was incredibly useful. I think I killed almost all but one Venom a lot of his troops, his Star Weavers, so that was a pivotal turn, uh, turn 3. Meanwhile, in my deployment zone, the Thunderfire Cannon was able to take out the troop that was slowly making their way along, but the Star Weaver managed to get in and kill four, I think four out of my five scouts. My turn, I moved up and charged in. Uh, hoping to destroy it. I'd surrounded it in such a way to minimise the number of models he could deploy if I destroyed it. And I think I did manage to take it out in combat. Um, however, his troop master and a couple of the troop managed to survive. And they went around for the rest of the game. They managed to kill the Thunderfire cannon, um, kill the ta one of the tactical squads and finish off the scout squads to rack him a few kill points. Fortunately, he wasn't able to kill the other one in the objective. Um, one of the key mistakes I forgot about was that when a unit dies, the Yinkarn can move to it. 
So I got incredibly lucky. I fired. I was all poised to go and charge him. I think I'd taken three or four wounds off him in combat. And he was down to three or four. I had most of my army surrounding him. Because by turn four or five, he had very little left. Went. Was ready to charge him. Fired the Thunderfire Can, the surviving troop. Only managed to kill one after I fluffed my rolls, but that was fortunate because if I'd have killed them, he would have teleported the Yinkan to the other side of the battlefield and I would have had no way to take it out while it caused havoc in my lines. So I got lucky there, managed to charge in with my most of my army, um, struck with my can on him, took him down to I think a single wound, the Yinkan, wasn't able to kill it. He, my opponent, uh, then decided to interrupt and go after the bikers. If he could ki wipe out the bikers, he could teleport the Yinkarn to where they were, so my other units in combat wouldn't be able to make it to him and take his last wound. However, he got unlucky. He did five wounds on the bikers, but each doing d6 damage and bypassing my armor, but then he rolled a one for the damage on one of his... Uh, units and he was out of CP so he got incredibly unlucky there it had it gone his way the Yinkarn would have survived in a wound might have been able to do some things score a few kill points so in the end a game I was fully expecting to do very poorly in actually I managed to win 19 to 15 I believe um, with as I say that key turn 3 when the Assault Doctrine activated I was able to do a ton of damage to his units and rack up 10 kill points in a single turn, which essentially helped save the game. If it wasn't for kill points though, I might have won in objectives, because it wasn't really a high scoring game objectives wise, because most of the time we were both sitting on two, or one each. Um, obviously we focused on each other's troops to kill them, and stop them from scoring the objectives, but in the end I just got lucky uh, in some cases. Thinking back, it might have been better to give my opponent the first turn and sit back and let him come to me. He had the fast moving units, he was probably going to come to me with a, much of his force and then hopefully I could go in, if he moved his units forward then I could move my bikes and my vehicles forward, disembark and put a lot of firepower into his venoms and into any troops that emerged. If he didn't, he just sat back because neither of us really had much in the way of long range firepower. Only I had my thunder fire cannon. So if he did sit back, I could just sit back. I had some units in reserve who could come in, try and do some damage, try and steal some objectives, move up with the vehicles, try and take care of them. Might have been worthwhile letting him, using my speed, letting him come to me dealing with the units that came to me either on mass or piecemeal and then using my reserves to mop up the units that were in his backfield um, especially since he deployed in such a way to prevent me getting first turn charges or really much of any uh, firepower at his units in the first turn so that was probably the best bet for that mission as well but fortunately as I say some luck my way some bad luck my opponent's way, I managed to pull a win out in the end. Again, the tactic of using the can to charge multiple units because he can't be hit by overwatch and he's got plus two to his charge was incredibly powerful. Um, allowing me to, as I say, tie up three units, almost three units in combat. Potentially, if I'd have targeted one of the Venoms with him, destroyed that, the cable lights would have come out and I could have potentially kept the Star uh, Skyweavers in combat and prevent them from, although they could still fall but prevent them from falling back. If they did fall back though, they could still shoot and charge as the Harlequins. But that was just unfortunate, I think. Um, I was really hoping to take out that unit, but um, a combination of the minus one to hat and some poor rolling meant I only managed to kill one and they were able to escape. And then turning, I don't think the scout bikers did anything to them in combat and then they just got wiped out incredibly with some great rolls. So overall, tough game. Um, didn't learn my lesson from turn, uh, game one with the drop pod and the uh, devastators. 
might have been worth keeping them in reserve to go after some of his units in subsequent turns or wait till I'd whittled down some of his CP so that he couldn't play lightning fast reflexes on them. Uh, so that could have been potentially useful as well to go after them. The other units seemed to perform quite well. The Thunderfire Cannon didn't do a great deal. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't much point again in this game using Tremor Shells to slow units down, and a lot of the minus one to hit and the invulnerable saves caused real problems. But the real key in this game was seeing the power of the Assault Doctrine combined with the White Scar's Devastating Charge. On the charge, they're getting plus one damage, they're getting minus one AP, so my... So my... Uh, Normal units are doing two wounds, and that was really great for racking up the Venoms. And my Warlord was doing D3 plus 1 damage, and the Captain with the Teeth of Terror was doing um, 3 damage each wound, which at their strength 5 was really good for taking on the Venoms. So that was game 2. Few lessons learned um, in activating the Assault Doctrine. Didn't learn the lesson with the Drop Pod again, but... A good game, really tough game that I was almost thinking about conceding towards the end of turn 2, but then I just had a great roll of saves and managed to turn it around in turn 3. Game 3 of the tournament was Resupply Drop with Search and Destroy deployment. Uh, resupply Drop is the one you have 4 objectives and you roll off at the start of each turn and if you draw, the objective doesn't move, but if someone wins the roll off, they get to move the objective up to three inches in any direction. Uh, so you can, it's difficult to sit on objectives for the whole game unless you're rolling really well, uh, so you kind of have to move around and grab them. Um, this mission was against Jack and his Necrons, and Jack was running uh, a Necron Lord Emotech, I think his name is, one of the special characters, a Cryptech, unit of 6 destroyers, unit of 19 Necron warriors, uh, 2 units of 10 immortals, a uh, Stalker, Triarch Stalker I think they're called, and 3 command barges, I think they're command barges, they didn't have the transport, um, and they had a big D6 shot strength 10 gun, um, and a load of uh, Goss fire. I think that's what he had. My One of the bugbears when I got to turn, my opponent didn't bring a copy of his list for me, it was just in his phone, so it's hard to remember after the fact. So, again, this mission, uh, managed to deploy first and take the first turn, and I played, turn one, I played very aggressively with the White Scars. I turbo boosted the Scout Bikers and the Captain up, straight at his um, units, as he, he had the tree arcs, the way he deployed, he had the tree arc stalker out in front, he had the necrons and had ruins, he had the two units of immortals and destroyers uh, sort of towards the back of his deployment zone and he was using his barges to basically screen his units so that I'd have to go through them. I had deployed most of my units up front with the bikes the uh, rhinos and my characters. I had left the Thunderfire Cannon and a couple of units of tacticals on the uh, objectives. I'd taken one unit of scouts with bolters to screen my backfield because he had the Veil of Darkness power and I didn't want them jumping in by my squads on the objectives. I put a unit of scouts, the combat scouts I put in a rhino along with the stern guard and the tacticals were in the other rhino. So as I say, got first turn, he failed to seize, went really aggressive, turbo boosting up the cat the can and the scout bikers. Again I played uh skilled rider on the scout bikers and I also played uh Born in the Saddle allowing them to shoot. This was one error, um, so in my, I think I did some shooting, the Devastators came down, managed to kill most of a unit of Immortals, which the Thunderfire Cannon then finished off to give me first strike, which was nice. I didn't want to go after the Destroyers, I thought I could do some damage to them, 
but then he would be able to... Uh, I wouldn't get first strike, so I wanted to get the point for that. Uh, in my charge phase, the again, the Psyker managed to get both powers off on my can to prevent Overwatch. In the charge phase, I think he declared a charge on the Destroyers, the Stalker and one of the Barges. Didn't roll high enough to get into the Destroyers, but did get the Barge and one of the... Uh, Catacomb, the barges in combat. The scout bikers followed them in, and then the librarian also managed to make like an 11 inch charge uh, on the stalker. I think with the can in the fight phase, I, I had basically wrapped around the stalker, so I didn't want to destroy that um, because then I would be relying on the can's ability to keep the barge in combat. But my scout bikers and librarian would be vulnerable. So the mistake mistake I made here was I wasn't sure I was going to be able to wrap it. So I put the three up and vun on the scout bikers where it should have gone on my other unit of bikers uh, to keep them safe because the scout bikers were safe in combat. So they can attack the barge, did some damage, but the quantum shielding managed to block. The one time I didn't want to roll high for damage, I see me only roll two and threes and then my opponent just managed to block a bunch of them, so did some damage on the barge. I think the scout bikers and the librarian took a few wounds off the stalker, but not enough to kill it, so that was fine. My opponent's first turn, uh, Emotek, or whatever his name is, used his storm ability to do... Uh, he managed to do six mortal wounds on my other unit of bikers and, and just shredded them, so the three up in one wouldn't help there. He did use the Veil of Darkness on the Warriors to teleport them near my deployment zone uh, and shoot up some scouts and tactical marines. I think he managed to kill a few, but not many. I think he was hoping to press forward with them and do some damage. Uh, the rest of the army, I think the destroyers fired and took out the Devastators. The Immortals, I think, shot... The, the Barges shot some of the Rhinos. Fortunately, didn't destroy any because I'd popped smoke with them the previous turn. I think took one down to four wounds. The other took four wounds, so was on six remaining. Didn't do a whole lot of damage. Might have killed a tactical squad or so. I'm sure he got first strike uh, with his Necron Warriors. Overall, not bad. I think did some damage on the drop pod. Uh, but got off a lot of luck here because I hadn't done as much damage. In his fight phase, I actually managed to destroy the uh, Stalker, freeing up my units, which was quite nice. Turn 2, um, again, just press forward with everything. Did some shooting, I think managed to do a few wounds in the destroyers, didn't manage to take them out. In my backfield, Put some units up on the uh, Necron Warriors, fired a lot with them, I think I brought down the Chainsaw Vanguard Veterans to try and take them out. Put a ton of firepower into the Necron Warriors, I think I killed 12 in the end. Uh, charged them with the unit of Tactical Marines, but fluffed my attacks and wasn't able to finish the unit off. And the Vanguard Veterans failed a charge because he was removing casualties, um, as you'd expect, to make the charge longer. So I think they went from a 9 inch charge to an 11 and failed to get in. The other side, I think I managed to kill the second unit of Immortals. Did some wounds on one of the barges. Um, charged into the destroyers, wasn't able to finish them off, unfortunately. Uh, so they were able to escape combat. His second turn, don't think went amazingly. I think the bikers were finished off, the scout bikers took a pounding. I think I lost about four of them to some terrible saves. Uh, he made some great, his, net, he, his re rolling was pretty hot throughout the game. He made, he rolled 12 reanimations on his Necron Warriors and I think got 7 or 8 back on a 5+. plus. Uh, fortunately, I think only one or two destroyers came back, um, and not the whole unit, thankfully, even on the 4-up with the Cryptek nearby. 
Turn 3, I think I... So I was feeling pretty confident about the game. Turn 3, I activated the Assault Doctrine once more. Brought the rest of my units in for a final push. Disembarked the Scout Squad and the Stern Guard to go after his units. The Destroyers were actually up on the upper levels of a Ruin. So what I did was I put the Scouts underneath the Ruin. So they needed a 6 inch charge to get up the two levels, but they couldn't be shot with Overwatch. So they managed to get in. I think I did some shooting, uh, moved up my Vanguard veterans to take out the rest of the Necron Warriors. And moved the Stern Guard up, moved my characters up to try and finish off the enemy units. The, the barges were causing me problems because I, I really didn't... The Quantum Shielding was really helping them stay alive. So in my turn... Charged the destroyers with the scouts, but failed to kill the last one. Uh, couldn't do any damage. My stern guard veterans helped finish off one unit and then went to charge the cryptic. He used his alt hit and staff thing and managed to kill three of them uh, with mortal wounds on the charge, so that was annoying. So they weren't able to kill him off. Uh, I think I managed to go in and surround his lord, but wasn't able to kill him, thanks to Zinvan, or uh, Emotech, sorry, because the lord was on the other side. Vanguard Vettens fluffed again, did some damage on the Necron Warriors, but my opponent was rolling hot for saves, and I was rolling terribly to wound. So, managed to kill, I think, three with four or five. Uh, no, he spent two CP to interrupt, managed to kill off two of the Vanguard Veterans, and the rest... Um, only managed to kill two or three with their 15 attacks and their um, Assault Doctrine, which was unfortunate. But at this point, it, it was still pretty close thanks to kill points. I'd been scoring a lot of the objectives um, because I was either surrounding them, so no matter where he moved them, they couldn't go off. And I'd effectively, apart from the unit of Necrons, Warriors and his Lord, I'd pinned most of his army into his deployment zone for the entire game um, using the aggressive moves of the bikes and all my vehicles so the bikes went in as the first wave tied up a bunch of units, stopped them manoeuvring and then the rest of the army came in slightly after that to um, pu push the pressure up and do some damage so that seemed to work out quite well so in the end I think we only got to turn 4 I ended up winning I think 14 points to 10 or 11. A lot of that was down to getting some kill points in the end. The minus 1 AP, 2 damage was great for taking out the barges with the Assault Doctrine active. However, as I say, he, did, he made quite a lot of quantum shielding saves. The annoyance with the Assault Doctrine is that my uh, captain kept rolling like 3 or 4 wounds. Uh, with his spear and getting the plus one uh, to give him three or four. And the other captain was doing three damage each time with the Teeth of Terror. So that was actually one of the cases where I'd rather do more wounds and less damage. I was doing more wounds and high damage, so he was able to block a lot of them. So it was a, a tough game. Um, I was feeling confident going into it, as I thought I, I can rush, got first turn, can rush the Necrons, Screen them out of my deployment zone, go after the objectives, um, which weren't a huge... I scored a lot of the objectives in the game, I don't think my opponent scored too many, because I was able to move them away. As I say, I was able to pin him into his deployment zone for much of the game, apart from that one unit in Necron Warriors who simply wouldn't die and kept making reanimations. I was able to pin them in. Um, he actually spent most of his CP, I think, on interrupting combats, which is, you know, unusual for the Necrons, and the destroyer protocols as well on the destroyers. Um, so yeah, that was a, an interesting game. It was uh, quite tactical, good uh, sort of back and forth, but able in the end just to use the sort of massed firepower and assaults to do a lot of damage to the Necrons, able to tie up units, stop them from falling back and keeping my units safe from the enemy firepower. Uh, the only thing that was the real problem was a lot of the mortal wounds. Um, the warriors were doing a lot of damage but the immortals, uh, with two up cover saves for many of my units, were helping me or the bikers being toughness 5 helping them out. 
So that was uh, worked out quite well in the end. So in the end, pretty good game. So I ended the tournament on two wins and a, a very narrow loss. So I was quite happy about that. As I say, this was only like my... I'd only had two or three games with the White Scars going in. So I was quite happy about that. Three very tough games, which I'm looking forward to writing up. So overall, not a bad performance for the White Scars. So I'm going to have a look at seeing how the army could be modified um, to improve it next time. So going over the army, um, going to look at what units worked, what units didn't work. Starting with the Warlord, the Can, really MVP in my games. The tactic I mostly used with him was advancing 22 inches on turn 1, ignoring terrain and ignoring units. So with his Relic Warbite, you're able to hide him behind some ruins or some cover in case you get seized on, and then go flat out. He generally, he got a first turn charge in two out of his three games. The only reason he didn't get it in the other game was it was Hammer and Anvil and my opponent deployed really deep in his zone. So, coupled with the Librarian giving him plus two to his charge and allowing him to ignore enemy overwatch was great. Based on my opponent's deployment, a lot of times I was able to get him into two or even three or four units giving me good odds of keeping at least one locked in combat with him uh, through one of his Warlord traits to stop him from being shot at, plus any unit supporting him like the Scouts or the Scout Bikers. His other Warlord trait for plus D3 was really useful as well. Um, I think I got two or three attacks most of the times he charged in, giving him eight, up to eight attacks at strength eight, AP minus three and D3 damage. In subsequent turns where he wasn't charging, he does go down to strength 4, so he can be a bit more limited against vehicles or tough infantry. So that was a bit of a downside, because um, you really want him to kill stuff in your opponent's turn. Although saying that, if you don't, you can fall back and charge in again, because you're white sc scars. The other captain with the Teeth of Terra, again, worked really well. He tended to stay back and support the bikers. Uh, with their melter guns to give them re-rolls. The Librarian was awesome. Uh, and the powers are really effective. What I'd probably take the Librarian again, but what I might do is not take that Relic. Uh, not take Mantle of the Storms here. Warp value 6 on both the powers isn't terrible, although a lot of times I did roll a 4 and have to use a reroll. I think in the Necron game I failed twice to get it off on a 5, um, thanks to the plus 1, so I had to use a reroll. What I would consider doing would be to give him something like the Armour Indomitus, to give him a 2-up save and a 3-up invun for one phase. Um, I think that would be really good, because once my opponent's figured out the buffs he could do with preventing overwatch and the extra charge, he became a real target. So one turn of overwatch for the counter, sorry, one turn of an invun save for your opponent's counter attack might be very useful for him. Um, as I say, sorry, I forgot to mention with the Warlord, I know it's risky charging him in, you can give up Warlord and he can die, but with a four up invun, Hopefully not being able to be shot in the enemy phase unless it's by pistols and a two up save in combat thanks to the buckler. I think he's reasonably durable. In fact, I only lost him in one game. Uh, he died and that was thanks to smites. Like he was hit by multiple smites from the uh, Yunari and Eldari units. And that's what killed him in the end. It wasn't the enemy shooting, it wasn't firepower, it was just smites being able to take him out. And I think a death jester or two being able to target him. So, fortunately there wasn't much to be able to do about that. The lieutenant worked quite well. Um, again, he can die, he can be targeted and die quite easily thanks to not having an invun. The power axe is decent, um, once you get the Assault Doctrine, he's doing 2 damage, at AP minus uh, 3, I believe it is, you know, minus 2 or 3, and the higher strength works out quite nicely as well. The Scout Bikers were pretty decent. Um, if you can advance, the, what they're really good at is supporting the can, because they can 
advance 22 inches and still charge. That gives them as much mobility as they can with the Relic War Bike. And their firepower is pretty good with the twin bolters and the shotguns. You can do a lot of damage. In combat, I actually found them to be pretty poor. They do have three attacks each on the charge, four for the sergeant. But I found that they really... Either my, my dice rolls were just fluffing, but they really didn't do much in combat. They struggled to do any damage, really. Um, what I might consider is putting a power weapon of some kind, maybe like a power axe on the sergeant to give me a bit more punch in combat, a bit more AP. So that would be good. The other unit of five bikers had two melter guns. Uh, again, very useful. I didn't use the bolters a whole lot because I was using uh, Bon the Saddle and the Scout bikers a lot of the time because they have better firepower. And I was also giving them a three up in one save to counteract their four up armor save. But the bikers did okay. I don't think the melter guns did too much. Um, mostly because of a, lo a lot of the armies I was facing had negative to that. Um, so they did okay, but not amazing. I think they did, the best game was game one where they managed to put five or six wounds on the flyer. So that was quite handy. The tactical squads were okay. Um, they, one with the plasma can, heavy bolter, were mostly held back as objective holders. So what I would maybe do for them if I was taking the army again to a similar tournament would be to get rid of the heavy weapons. Um, I think in three games I fired the heavy bolt or maybe twice and the plasma cannon maybe four or five times over the course of three games. So that's just some extra points I can save I think. Uh, the reason for this was most of the game I kept them hidden out of line of sight in the ITC rune rules just to hold objectives. So there wasn't much need for them to have the heavy weapon. A few extra bolter shots are fine, but it was mostly a waste. The other unit tactical marines with the flamer and the power sword did okay. Pretty well in combat in the charge. The power sword's nice. Managed to get them up the table. No, no real problems with that. The rhinos worked really well, actually. Getting to assault and charge with them means they actually get a lot of mobility. And they're really good at tying up, excuse me, got the hiccups. They're really good at tying up uh, enemy vehicles or soaking up firepower a lot of the time. So they, they, the rhinos actually proved really effective. The Thunderfire Cannon didn't do amazingly, but I think its potential makes it worth keeping the list. The problem. Um, I had in the game was a lot of the armies I was playing either had so many units with fly that I couldn't use the tremor cell stratagem or had a lot of invun saves against shooting. Uh, so the extra AP on turn one really wasn't much of an issue for it. So I think potentially, I did fire it twice a few times. I don't think I ever it was ever necessary. I don't think I ever needed it to get first blood. Again, my target priority was off some of the time, but um, I would probably take the Thunderfire Cannon again because against certain matchups, certainly a lot of the armies there it had the potential to be devastating. If less for its damage output, which is although is quite considerable, and more for the ability to fire double tremor shells to slow down enemy units. As I say, it just so happens I faced um, Eldar two games in a row with so many fly units and no real reason to use Tremor shells. There was no units it was worth spending the CP on to keep them say, uh, slow as opposed to just firing at them with the Thunderfire Cannon as normal. The Scouts did pretty well. Um, they do what they do. They're good for area control and for... Uh, Getting in close to the enemy's face. With Shock Assault, the combat unit can actually do pretty good on the charge. Um, they rarely survive much of the game or to get use of the Assault Doctrine, but if it's open, they can do well with it. So I'd, Scouts, I think, are worth it to screen 
drop pods, go after objectives, block your enemy in, that sort of thing. They're quite handy. Uh, they're cheap screening units from my backfield, like in the Necron game. The Sterngard veterans did okay. Not amazing. The Bolter, again, it might have been the opponents I was playing, but the AP2 really didn't come into much effect in my games, thanks to all the invulnerable saves. Also, with the Tactical Doctrine active, they are AP-3, but uh, normal bolters, a cheaper normal bolter squad might have been better uh, to get the AP-1. The Vanguard Veterans, actually, the unit I threw in, the five plasma pistols that I threw in, uh, just as an afterthought, actually ended up performing better in most cases. Um, able overcharge and then charging in and still getting four attacks each on the charge with the shock assault rule. The dual chainsword ones were a little disappointing. As I say, I charged them into the unit Necron Warriors, fully expecting 25 attacks, hitting on threes, wounding on fours, AP minus one with the assault doctrine. Fully expected them to do a lot of work in my games, but they really didn't. I might consider, it's more expensive, but I might even consider switching them out. I have a unit of uh, five with two lightning claws. I think it's an extra ten points or something per model, but if they can get in with the charge, which there are ways to buff them to do that, if they get in the charge on the, uh, so they're AP minus two, um, four attacks on the charge, rerolling to wound, then, once the Assault Doctrine is active, they then go up to AP-3 and 2 damage each. So I think this unit, if you held them off to turn 3, I managed to get the charge in. As I say, there's some stratagems, psychic powers, things you can get going. Uh, I think they would do a lot of work, more so than the Chainsword ones, who were a little disappointing. <clears throat> Although, speaking of which, the biggest disappointment in my list was the Grav Cannon. Devastators in the drop pod. Um, as amazing as these guys were in 6th and 7th, they really didn't... I've been using them in a few games now and they just haven't been performing for me. I don't know if that's the targets I'm going after or my opponent's armies, but um, certainly at this tournament they really didn't live up to their potential. Uh, two games... I'll give them a pass on. I was getting either minus two or minus three to hit on the unit against Eldari and Yunari. So that's obviously going to hurt their firepower significantly, especially when, since you're minus one to come in. I think a unit like this would be incredible. Obviously in something like Iron Hands, you're ignoring the penalty, you're re-rolling, you're at AP minus four or five. I can't remember what it is. Iron Hands, these guys would be amazing. White Scars, I just don't think they're worth it for me. Um, the priority, could be my target priority is off, could just be unlucky with my opponents, but I really didn't find they did much. They came in, did a little bit of damage, and then died. I think game one, they killed two Shining Spears, and then they died. Game two, they killed like three or four Harlequins, then they died. Game three, they killed, I think, eight immortals, eight or nine immortals, and then they died in the following turn. I just don't think it's worth the points that they cost taking them. So that is one unit I would probably ditch. So thinking about the army overall, it's incredibly fast. The mid-strength shooting, got a ton of strength four uh, firepower. There's a lot of damage there against infantry, normal troops, great. Where the army does suffer is long range firepower and a lot of anti-tank firepower. What I'd probably do would be to switch out the Devastators, Grav Devastators for a Missile Launcher or Last Cannon Devastator Squad. This wouldn't be too much more expensive, if, or I think it's the same cost if I take missile launchers. 
And what this would do would be to give me some long range firepower and some good anti-tank firepower. Uh, who hopefully won't have to move and won't suffer the minus one to hit. So would do quite well against any negative modifiers. I think that would help give me some longer range firepower. Um, other units, the melter guns on the bikes work okay. I would maybe consider taking a unit, an attack bike or two with multi melters because they're white scars, they don't suffer the penalty for moving and shooting. So backed up by a captain, maybe the lieutenant, they could do a lot of work in the shooting phase. Uh, especially since they're AP minus 5, they'll be denying saves to almost everything in the game and could do some work to enemy units quite nicely. Um, you can. What's also nice with them is if you want the additional range, you could advance with them 20 inches and play a stratagem that allows them to treat the heavy weapons as assault and they don't suffer the minus one to hit for... Uh, fire and assault weapons because they're white scars bikers. So you can advance them 20 inches, shoot with the multi melt, are still hitting on a 3 plus. You don't get the extra AP on Tom 1 for the Devastator Doctrine, but they're AP minus 4 anyway. So most vehicles aren't going to be getting a save against them unless they have an Invun or a, they're a Land Raider, they have a 2 up armor save. So that's pretty good. That should potentially give them a 32 inch melter range which should be enough on most deployment types to get into range to do some damage to enemy firepower and then you're re-rolling, you're picking 2d6 and picking the highest damage for each wound. So backed up by a captain and a lieutenant. Um, it would be nice to have a lieutenant on a bike in order to keep up with the bikers. That was the problem I had was my... Some of the times my librarian and my lieutenant were languishing, languishing a bit behind. Because the bikers have the set advance, they are moving very quickly and they're reliable. If you need to advance the librarian or the lieutenant, sometimes you roll poorly. They're, only, they're moving two inches less than most of the bikers, four inches less than the scout bikers. So they really suffer to keep up. Maybe when they release the new legends, we'll get those options back, or we can use them from the index. But they can be pretty expensive still using the index points values, so it would be nice to be able to have that. Um, overall, I liked how the army worked. As I say, I'd probably keep the bikes, keep the scouts, keep the tactical squads, but take the heavy weapons off. Um, lose the stern guard. I don't think there's a need for them in this list. Either replace them with more tactical marines, Although they're not that expensive, they're only I think a point or two than tactical marines maybe. <clears throat> so it could be worth keeping them just for that extra AP. And they're plus one to win stratagem which I didn't actually use at any point. The Vanguard Veterans, I might switch out the chainsaws for Power Claws. See how they get on. Uh, Lightning Claws, sorry, not an orc. <clears throat> Keep the Thunderfire because of the potential. Lose the Drop Pod. Maybe add another unit of bikers or add some more scout bikers to the army. Um, I think that has some potential. What I will say tactically with the army, it would be really nice to have a regained CP uh, warlord trait that I could give to another character. The reason for this is doing all the tactics, doing everything I want to do, um, this army just burns through CP. I think I was using more than half in my first turn alone. Some turns I was going down to 2 CP, um, although a lot of them I was burning 2 to shoot the Thunderfire Cannon, which was a complete waste uh, in most of my games, firing that twice. I don't even think I bothered doing it in the third game because I'd wiped out the one unit to get first strike in one turn, so I didn't spend the CP to do it again. Um, yeah, once you spend 2 CP on the Thunderfire Can to make it shoot again, you're paying 1 for uh, Bond the Saddle on the Scout Bikers, you're giving one of your bike squads an invulnerable save for 2 CP, that's you already done to 5. If you're using Gravitic Amplification, 
That's 6 CP, I'm down to 4. So this army will quite, you know, if I'm having to re-roll to get my psychic power off, if I roll poorly, that's uh, 7. And I'm basically out of CP on turn 1. Don't get me wrong, the Alpha Strike is very powerful, but this army just burns through them. But there's not too much I can do about that, uh, unless I want to take another character. Saying that, the having a... There was a couple of times in the game I forgot to leave. I was either going to leave the captain or the lieutenant back with the Thunderfire to benefit their re-rolls because they weren't needed to support the bikers. A lot of the times I advanced from the bikers, I had no units to shoot at because my opponent, the way my opponent deployed or how I deployed. So I kept forgetting to leave them back to benefit from the re-rolls and really up the damage potential of the Thunderfire. Because against most units, you're hitting on twos, re-rolling ones, and you'd be wounding on threes, re-rolling ones. So the damage potential is, is quite high with that. So overall, I am enjoying how the army's playing. It's certainly a big boost to the Space Marines over the last Codex. Um, with all the sort of previews and rules coming out, it looks like the White Scars could be one of the weaker chapters, but that doesn't mean to say they're weak. I think just compared to things like the Iron Hands or Raven Guard or Ultramarines, they're maybe not as powerful up front. One of the big sticking points is once you get the Assault Doctrine activated, it is incredible. Um, it really boosts their combat potential. Combined with Shock Assault, doing 2 damage on a basic marine at AP-1 is fantastic. The problem is you need to wait till turn 3 for that. And in a lot of games by turn 3, with the firepower in the game and certain units you maybe don't have much of your army left, unless you're holding a big chunk in reserve to benefit from that, which I was doing sometimes with my Vanguard veterans, you really don't have much um, left, or, or you could not have much left. Don't get me wrong, in one of my games it was incredible, I did amazingly well on turn 3 when the Assault Doctrine was activated. Problem being, it takes a while to get there, there's no way to speed it up compared to some armies who are strong from the Devastator or the Tactical Doctrine off the bat. But it was very powerful and it worked quite well. Um, it's just a problem of keeping enough units alive long enough to benefit from it. And as I say, the army burns through a lot of CP. I s tended to use the same stratagems, which were Born in the Saddle, um, I tend to use the same stratagems, which were Born in the Saddle, uh, Skilled Riders, to give me a 3 up and run save, the Fire Twice with the uh, Thunderfire stratagem. There's a few of the White Scars ones I didn't use. I never used um, Disembarkation, or Rapid, rapid Disembark, to deploy my units after a Rhino's moved. I think it's really good, it just didn't come up in any of my games. I didn't use the 6 plus D6 advance. Again, really powerful, potentially, you know, amazing under certain situations. But a lot of the times I was purposefully not killing everything my units in combat were in order to stop them falling back and do more damage that way. So it didn't really come up. And there are, as I say, there was a bunch I'd want to spend them on, but I just didn't have the CP left. They do have another nice stratagem, which gives them an additional AP minus one when the Assault Doctrine's active, but that is two CP, but everyone goes up to AP minus two and damage two on basic guys, which is incredible. However, it's very rare that I have two CP left remaining at the end of, or uh, uh, coming up to turn three. Uh, so it's rare to use that. What might be worth doing is taking a second librarian in order to access some of the um, obscuration discipline to steal CP or you know do some tricks with them. So it's something that I'm going to maybe consider. Uh, potentially adding some Primaris. I think once the Impulsor's released 
uh, getting my Primaris units up close to the enemy quickly, either to shoot or at AP minus two when the tactical doctrine's active, or to do get them in assault range. Uh, you know, with two attacks base on the Primaris, they can do a lot of damage uh, when they charge if the assault doctrine's active. So that's something to think about. But at the moment I'm enjoying the White Scars. Uh, the army plays quite nicely. It's nice having them back on the table. So I hope you enjoyed that report. Found it useful. Uh, any comments, if you've got any tips for using the White Scars more effectively or want to know more, please comment below. And remember to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.